Hey, how are you doing? We've almost made it. It's a bit bittersweet. I'm going to take one second. This is the recording of my hype song. Isn't that gorgeous? <laughs> All right, g'day. So, uh, my name's Ryan. As you'll see in the next couple of slides, I have a problem with emojis. But before that, I'm talking about what you can't do with Laravel. And really, in my experience, I've not found anything I can't do in Laravel. So this is my first time speaking at a Laracon, uh, so I'll do the normal thing. I'm new to the community. I'll give you a bit of an overview about me. I'm a proud Adelaidean with um, the rest of the... Yeah, exactly right. Exactly right. Uh, I have nine-year-old twins. I'm a dad to nine-year-old twins. You've seen my daughter, my son, her twin brother. I've got some cool hobbies. If you want to talk about radios or planes or coffee, hit me up uh, this afternoon and I'll be your man. Um, interestingly enough, I do consider myself a baby developer. So... Um, although I've been mucking around with CodeIgniter and PHP and Laravel since 2014, I've only been working full-time as a developer for the last three years. And we have to have a requisite cat pick, so that's Pixie, he's at home now by himself. <laughs> so kind of, Michael kind of stole my thunder. What is it that you just can't do with Laravel? So this is a video, I don't like videos and presentations, it only goes for 90 seconds, but it's okay. So this is a video about the National Ambulance Service of Papua New Guinea. So Papua New Guinea is a country north of Australia. It's got about 11 million people, 460,000 square kilometres, mostly highland jungle, uh, which is about 178 million square miles for our American friends. Now, while you're watching this video, every single piece of technology in this video, from the phone to the software that they're running on their workstations, to the radios, to the pages, to the in-vehicle uh, tablets, are all either running Laravel apps or they're integrated so tightly with Laravel app that it'd be useless otherwise. So let's have a quick look. St. John's ambulance emergency. Uh, Scotty just fell down. I'll transfer a to one of the medical calls. They can get the person be things, right? The location, please. Um, behind the church hall. I'm going to send you a message, and in that message, there's a link, you click on that link. Yes, I already clicked on it. Hello, Steve, come back. Yes, sir, I'm going to send you a message. Is he breathing? Yes, he's breathing, but he's not awake. Hurry, hurry. Please, hurry. Please, I'm going to enter the case number of the case is 97031. You have to proceed to case location, all in one. Turn four, signal five and five, unit proceeding case. Oh. Uh, what's the current uh, situation of the case? We have uh, the dispatcher dispatched. We have called Alpha 93 uh, with the clinician on board already proceeding. Scotty, Scotty. Hello, Sinjian Ambulance, how can I help? Saving lives and helping Papua New Guineans 24-7, seven days a week and 365 days a year. So my business partner's in the front row and <clears throat> we go into often, uh, we, go, we go into meetings with clients, we go into meetings with consultants and they say, oh, tell us what stack your, your application's built in. I say, yeah, sure, it's Laravel View WebSockets. They go, you can't do that in PHP, you can't do that in Laravel. They say you can't build life-critical systems in, parallel, in Laravel. So let's just pause that for a minute. I just want to take you on a journey of how we define, like how I define and how our business defines life-critical. So I, I called my friends in the Queensland Ambulance Service last week and I said, how many emergency calls do you answer a year? So triple zero, nine one one, one one two. One point one eight million calls they answer a year. 3,200 a day, about 135 an hour. So I can tell you from my experience that about half of those are what we call a priority zero or a priority one, so a potentially life-threatening emergency. So that is a life-critical call every 48 seconds. So think about that. If that system's not available and, on, and online for more than 50 seconds, somebody's having a bad day and there's a potentially adverse outcome for a patient. Well, if we put this in kind of tech terms, 48 seconds is six nines. 
which is silly, but I'll come back to this. So why am I talking about this? I am absolutely not an expert developer. I don't consider myself an expert developer. There's lots that I don't know, which, you know, I was listening to the panel and I think, I've never seen that in PHP. But I do think I have a bit of experience in emergency service operations. So I know, so there's, I mean, again, Michael stole my thunder. I often don't talk about what I call my old life, don't talk about the war. Um, and this is not a resume bomb, but it's, I think it's important context for the kind of pers the, the perspective that I bring to the rest of the presentation. So for the last 25 years, I've been a paramedic. I started being as a paramedic as a baby uh, in Sydney in 2000. I've worked right across New South Wales, working frontline treating patients. I've worked as a frontline manager. I've worked as a clinical support officer. And then I spent seven years working in the Sydney Triple Zero Centre, so where we answer triple zero calls and dispatch ambulances. That Sydney centre answers an emergency call every 27 seconds. And I ended up running that centre for a couple of years as their manager. Uh, after that, I became Chief of Staff of New South Wales Ambulance. It's a $1 billion government agency. Uh, that was a bit silly, and my family at the time decided we needed a tree change. And so I applied for a role in South Australia, was successful, and I finished out my paramedic career as the Executive Director of Statewide Operations for the South Australian Ambulance Service. And then for my sins, after I retired from paramedicine in, in 2021, I was elected head of the Australasian College of Paramedicine. So I still have some uh, relationship with the profession. Um, so it's about the merging of these two worlds for me. It's about different perspectives. And because if you can learn from multiple fields of practice and multiple types of experiences, I think you have a force multiplier that you can apply to your everyday life. And in medicine, there's, a, there's, this, there's this belief that you're always practicing. You always see people practicing medicine, practicing law. Um, you'd never really obtain expertise. Because in medicine, nobody has a monopoly on correct. The evidence is what tells us how we practice. So in 2014, I was working in New South Wales Ambulance. We developed an application in PHP 5 called uh, CADLINK. Yes, native MySQL queries. It was a whole thing. Still running to this day. Uh, we ended up winning a National Industry Award for that. In 2022, the product you saw in PNG went live. And then this year, uh, we've had, it, we've had one of our most recent customers in New South Wales has been using the platform to run all of the major events. City to Serve, the Bathurst 1000, the Easter Show, and they're going to use it this year to run New Year's Eve. Medical responses to those events. So let's go on a journey. If anyone can pronounce the second line, I'll give you something. Um, so, the, <laughs> very pathetic. So, I, these are my observations, my experiences, and my perspectives of developing these type of systems and how to make them awesome. And because nobody told me I couldn't do it, I went and did it anyway. However, there will be some heresy. <laughs> Everything and everyone is different. Experiences are different. These are my reflections. It's also not a presentation saying this is how you must do it. For your, you know, for your perspective, for your business, for your product, this might not be right. But I'm asking you to think about why, to be mindful in your technical and architectural decisions. And I've always been an upstart, so I'm just going to do it anyway. Right, you know how you go into a restaurant, you get these on the menu, like chili, chili peppers, saying how spicy a particular dish is going to be? Well, these are my heretical witches. <laughs> Unfortunately, the emojis, I was hoping for a more scary witch, but it's a friendly witch, so that's cool. Okay, so if there's one, so as I go through the presentation, if there's one heretical witch, ooh, it's a little bit controversial. If there's three heretical witches, you're welcome to grab your pitchforks and storm the stage. So in life critical systems, we have two goals. The first is, min oh, I went too far. The first is minimizing outages. There's no place for hyperbole when you're dealing with life and death. If you came and told me when I was running an ambulance service that you were going to give me a product that would never go off, I would not buy your product because it's crap. So we're not, about, we're not trying to eliminate outages, we're just trying to minimize, minimize outages because outages will happen. What's more important is recovery time, how quickly we can get from off back to a stable operating state as quickly as possible. But one of the real peculiarities that we have is that scale's not an issue. So the biggest life-critical systems in the world are hundreds of users at most. So we're not, we don't have the same problems with scale. Like, I get scared about finance systems. That's super, like, this is fine. Finance systems scare the hell out of me. The systems at scale scare the hell out of me. Okay, how do we do this? Okay, there's six easy steps. Boring is beautiful. Know your code. Love your exceptions. Sunshine is the best disinfectant. Train like you fight. 
and the best friends are critical. Let's go. Boring is beautiful. Keep it simple. Everybody has said this today. Every presenter over the last few days has mentioned this, which I love because I get to come and just summarize the conference. Keep it simple. The more complexity you have, the more things that can go wrong. Is Respond to One simple? Absolutely not. It's incredibly complex. We've got, no, oh, it, it scares me some days. But it's about, it's about implementing the things that you want to do in as simpler a way as possible. So this is a guy called Destin Sanderland. He has a YouTube channel called Smarter Every Day. Awesome. And he's like the most passionate guy about science education you've ever met in your life. Anyway, a couple of uh, months ago, he got invited to present to the American Astronautical Society, and he did a presentation, he chose to do a presentation on the Artemis program, which is the taking people back to the moon. So it's a successor to Apollo. And in his research for that presentation, he found this document, NASA SP-287. Unlike Jack, I don't have a physical copy because I'm allergic to paper, but you can find it if you search for it. And in this, and so this, is, this was a report that was written by the Apollo engineers at the end of the program. They told them, and Destin, this is the quote, they wrote the playbook on how to send people to the moon. And in that, they said this, and it's, not a, it's, a, it's a quote which I'm going to provide in context. So they said, build it simple, and then double up on as many components or systems so that if one fails, the other will take over. So it's about taking over. They're not talking about highly available systems. They're not talking about, hot, hot, not talking about things that are working at the same time and working out, because that's, that's added complexity. They're talking about redundancy. Because is duplication really more reliable than a simple, well-maintained, well-built system. So this is how they're planning to send somebody back to the moon. So they're planning to do, for the first time, in-orbit refueling of rockets. We've never done this before as a species, ever. And to get Artemis, to get the first person from Earth to the moon in the Artemis program, we have to do it 12 times. And Destin said, he said to the, he said to the engineers, is this the simplest solution? He said, don't get fixated on a technology de demonstration, focus on the mission. So Daniel Colburn, this is Larry, like, it's, it's great because we've just heard about Daniel. <laughs> um, so Daniel Colburn at Laravel, uh, Laracon EU, he goes, you know there's that system that's you know, it's been running code you haven't touched in 10 years and it just works fine? Why are we over-engineering our solutions? Sometimes there is such a thing as too clever. If it works, it's not stupid or wrong. Sure, there may be a better way to do it. There may be the, the way you've seen it done in YouTube videos or you've seen it in documentation. But give yourself a break. If it works, it's not stupid or wrong. And on that path, you're going to have failure. Failure's OK. We're human. And again, Dave spoke about this yesterday in the context of psychological safety. And I used to give presentations, I still do, I give, I give presentations to, to graduating paramedics. And I say to them, you guys are human, you've just done three or four years of education, you're about to work on work, shift work 12 hours a day, out in the rain, in the heat, in somebody's house at a railway station, you are going to make mistakes. That's okay, that's fine, you're going to make mistakes. But you need to do two things. And thank you, Josh, you need to fail so, sorry, thank you, Jack, you need to, I should have known I was drinking with him on the other night. Um, <laughs> do it safely. Have the systems and processes in place so that failures are not catastrophic and you don't end up with a pile of metal at the bottom of a hill. And then, more importantly, respond appropriately. A measure of character is how we respond to failure, how we learn and how we adapt and how we move on and continue to practice. Okay, number two, know your code intimately. Sam Levy is in the audience. He's going to be somewhere here because I was sitting next to him earlier. Sam Levy gave a presentation at last year's Laracon. It's absolute, absolute gold as a presentation. I could have included 50 quotes for development teams or for individual developers. Go and have a watch for it. It's absolutely magic about accessible code for developers. Clever code is not accessible. He said to me, he said, when we're doing it, he said in the presentation, when we're doing it, there was nothing in there that wasn't understandable just by going line by line. One hour ago, right here, Taylor said almost exactly the same thing. Simplicity. Uh, 
Sam said, I don't know why the array reduce function exists. It should almost always be a for each loop unless you're just trying to be fancy. Clever code is not accessible code. Keep it simple. Now, you know that function that you wrote last week? Yeah, you know the one. You're like working on it for a couple of hours. You remember what it does. You remember what, it want, what you wanted it to do. What about that same function that you wrote last month? What about last year? And in a bit of personal trauma, what about the one you wrote in January 2018? <laughs> First spicy take. I've never had inline documentation that I regretted adding it when I needed it most. When things are off and you're looking through the code saying, why the hell did this fail? And you've got a big block of text at the beginning of the function that goes, this is what I wanted it to do. And this is how I did it. And this is what I tried. And this is what didn't work. I've never had, and people tell you, don't put inline documentation. Your code should be self-evident. I agree. Code should be self-evident. But I've never had inline documentation that I regretted adding. Likewise, I don't think there's such a thing as too much logging. Again, people tell me, Ryan, you shouldn't be logging. There's hundreds of lines of, logs, of, of text going into your log files. But when the chips are down, and again, <laughs> we had just present Nightwatch yesterday. Like, that level of observability is essential. We don't have that right now. So in proxy, in, 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 as a proxy for that, I log. I'd rather know what's happening than not know what's happening, especially when something goes off. I can go down, 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 down. Ah, I see where we had our problem. I can go and find that bit of code. And make sure you can find your, if you're going to log, make sure you can search, make sure you can search through your code and find what generate. Don't do it like an error 1267, no, but make it searchable. Because when you're doing these things, again, I'm going to keep coming back to it. Think about it. Is this the same? When, you're when you're developing and knowing your code, is this the simplest solution? OK, number three, love your exceptions. <sighs> How many, I, how many exceptions do you see a day, maybe? A day. How many exceptions do you see a day? A thousand? Ten thousand? I got, I got kind of hives watching the, the, the Nightwatch demo because there were hundreds of exceptions. Because we have a policy, seriously, we have a policy of goal zero. But this does not mean you do this. <laughs> sure, <laughs> sure, try and catch your exceptions but please do something with them. This is your opportunity to introduce redundancy. So we have a process, a process which I'm going to talk about in a bit, where we do uh, reverse geolocations. So we, we try, we've got a, an API provider, we try that, doesn't work, you know what we do? We try a different API provider. You know what happens if that doesn't work? We try a different API provider. Then we try a local database which has some limited lookups, and then if that doesn't work, we return a plain lat long. We never fail out of that process. Every exception is an opportunity. It's an opportunity for improvement. It's an opportunity for a better user experience. They're your best friend, and some days they're your, wor they're your worst enemy. But an exception is your application telling you that something is wrong. It's an opportunity. It's a gift. Take it. I'm a dad. My children are homeschooled. I'm sitting there on a Zoom call, normally with Tristan, and I hear from the other end of the house, Dad, 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 can you hear me, Dad? Then he sends me a text message, Dad. <laughs> Make, and then you're like, fuck's sake, yep, let's go. What do you, Tristan, wait, what do you want, mate? Oh, can I have a cup of water? Oh, it's right there. Um, <laughs> Make your exceptions so annoying that you're forced to fix them. Don't just send them off to Sentry and be done. Don't drop them into a Slack channel that nobody monitors. This is what I do. Again, I'm not saying this is right for you, because some days, yes, I get 20,000 emails. Every single exception from a dev system, a UAT, a pre-prod, or a prod system, every single exception gets emailed. Because I can tell you what, when you can't do your job because you've got 10,000 exceptions sitting in your inbox, you bloody well fix it, don't you? <laughs> Okay, number four, sunshine is the best disinfectant, or bad, uh, black boxes, bad news. More dependencies equals more dependency. More dependencies equals more fragility. That last quote was from, Lara, uh, was from Taylor and Matt on the Laravel podcast two weeks ago. Who can you depend on not to break things in your system? 
So I just finished a, a, a consulting gig with New South Wales Health, building, again, <laughs> life critical applications. Uh, and New South, Wales, New South Wales Health is an Oracle, they run Oracle databases, they're an, an Oracle house. Don't, just for the record. <laughs> Um, and we, so we were using the, the Yadra OCI8 package. Now, a few versions ago, they changed the eloquent grammar. So they actually changed how queries were constructed using that package. We went from having a system that had sub-second queries to one that had queries time out between versions. Now, we caught that in UAT, thankfully. We caught that in UAT. But what happened if it made it to production? If you don't know exactly how a package or API or feature works, how will you fix it when it breaks? And who are you going to rely on to fix it when it breaks? Uh, so this is the real engineering. I spend way too much time watching aerospace YouTube channels. Um, this is the real engineering YouTube channel. And a, a, few, a few months ago, they interviewed the CEO of uh, Firefly Aerospace. Firefly is it's a space launch company like SpaceX or Blue Origin, um, but they do little satellites. And they, uh, they just broke the record in time from call to launch for tasking. So they got a call from the US Space Force, said, hey, we've got this satellite, we want to inject it into this orbit. Uh, and they launched it 24 hours later. They broke the previous record by 21 days. These guys live agile. These guys are where it's at. <laughs> It's hard to rely on vendors. They had, a, they had a launch scrub. This is what started this quote. They, it's hard to rely on vendors for some components. We don't know the design. It's hard for us to understand why they fail. For critical components, it's better for us to bring those in-house because when it fails, we have the engineers that know them. Minimise your uncertainty and own your destiny. This is not saying don't use first-party packages, don't use third-party packages. We have some weird and wonderful packages. But minimise the uncertainty and know what's inside them. So this is a counter to exceptions. So exceptions are your application telling you when something's not happening. But if you're wanting your application to actually do something, what are you doing to make sure that it actually happens? If you're launching a job into a queue, how do you know that it actually went and it got executed? If you're going to run a cron job or call an API, how are you going to know? I use watchdogs, we've got hundreds of them. Every time something happens, it just kicks the dog nicely, touches, nudges the dog, and so we know that it happened. If, we don't, if it doesn't happen in a defined period of time, like it's really agricultural, but it's simple and it works. Okay, okay. I love, like I love, I love these pipelines, I do, and we use them in some applications. But are they simple or are they black boxes? And when you're off, how can you get back on quickly? If you push a bad update through a pipeline and it gets deployed, how quickly can you push a fix through? Sometimes SSHing into a box and doing a manual git pull is the simplest solution. It's not automated, it's not sexy, it's not a technology demonstration, but when you want to, when you want to fix that, when you want to revert, it's one command. Git pull, ah, I've broken it, git reset. We're talking about seconds as opposed to potentially minutes or longer. Likewise, put as many barriers between you and the deployment as prod as possible. Because you will make a mistake. We're human, we fail, it's cool. But you will make a mistake. So acknowledge that, we run a checklist. You know, pilots run a checklist before they take off. Surgeons run a checklist before they cut into you. We run a checklist. I don't save passwords. Or I don't save SSH keys or passwords on production servers. I'm forced to put in a username and a token every time I want to do a git pull on a production system, on a like, customer-facing production system, because it gives, me every, it gives me three opportunities to go, is this the right branch? Is this the right update? Is this the right server? Is this the right customer? No, it's, it's always the right customer. Because just because somebody else, just because everyone else is doing something, it's never been a good idea for you to do it. We, we were taught this in school, <laughs> right? Group thing, peer pressure. If you do something, do it for a reason. Don't get focused on a tech, don't get fixated on a technology demonstration. Focus on the mission. Okay, number, we're almost there. Train like you fight. Oh, I mean, all right. Train like you fight. Now, I don't love this analogy, but it's so apt that I just had to include it. Again, this is a bit controversial. Sorry, Kath. Kath and I had this debate very respectfully, but she, she put me in my, she sat me down a bit at a Laravel Adelaide meetup. I, I think your dev environment must match your production environment. 
because you can't develop in one, in one architecture and then push to a different architecture because you're, that's introducing uncertainty. And our goal is to minimize uncertainty and to own our destiny. If your production environment is an AWS VM, what's stopping your dev environment from being an AWS VM? Because then you can catch the issues in dev, but make it more resource constrained. No plan survives contact with the enemy. This is a quote from some military person, I don't know. Um, <laughs> hubris has no place in these systems. You can build quality code like your life depends on it, but you can never predict the edge cases, build in redundancy. I used to run ambulance services. Our whole job was to pick up the pieces when life breaks, right? Because we have to acknowledge that you will go off. Jack told us you can have all the plans in the world, but if you don't put the handbrake on, or you're not an active cab, you've got a pile of metal at the bottom of the hill. Plan for your outage and plan for your recovery. You will go off. It's going to happen. Like, it's certainty. Death and taxes, right? The whole thing. Plan for how you're going to get back on. Who's going to do what? How are they going to do it? Do they have the right access? Where do we have our plans? That's what's going to happen. OK, so this is how we test. This is a test. It's an exam. It's a test, right? This is Harvard Medical School. This is how we test doctors. We put them in a room. We teach them for 10 years how to do something. We stick them in a room and make them fill in forms. Um, <laughs> this is testing abstract knowledge in isolation. This is not how we train our medical professionals. This is how we train our medical professionals. We simulate. We get an environment that's as close to real life as we possibly can. It's called high fidelity simulation. People build careers out of this stuff. So we find an environment that's as close to life as possible, real life as possible, and we chuck them in. Because simulations test systems and processes. They don't test this, they don't test abstract knowledge, they don't test one thing. They test systems and processes from end to end. No test covers every situation, so simulate. Now, there was going to be a live demo, but my thing was way long, so we've commented out the live demo. Um, <laughs> we, we, so we have, it, we have, you know, we, so our customers have fleets of ambulances, and we put little boxes into them that are telemetry devices. They tell us where the ambulance is, how fast it's going, blah, blah, blah. Uh, this, so then they hit a, TC, a TCP endpoint, written in Laravel, uh, with little payloads of data. Strings, binary strings, try doing binary string decoding. Um, this is, the, this is what, the, what they call, it's called, they're called automatic vehicle location systems, AVL systems. This is what our AVL system pipeline looks like. Every different color is a different system. It is, it is without question our most complex pipeline for reasons, like there's always reasons. Um, I get, like, I lose sleep over thinking about how to test this. So we don't. You know what we did? We spent half a day, we wrote a simulator. We wrote a simulator that says, pick a start lat long and an end lat long, use an API to route between them, give us the thousand lat longs along that route, and we just, we just drip feed them into the top of the, of the pipeline. And we have found so many edge cases you just can't imagine by doing that. Um, because we simulate. We're literally simulating the real world, and we get to test all of those systems in real time, all of those functions, all of those processes. Okay, let's steam on. Number six, last one, we're almost there. Uh, the best friends are critical. Now I heard uh, there's a podcast, I also listened to too, like too much, too many aerospace YouTube channels, too many podcasts. There was a podcast, and sorry Michael, there was a podcast that Dorinda was on, he, he kind of made the opposite point to this, but that's okay. <laughs> Have at least one sympathetic customer who will break things for you in production, but, in an environment of managed consequence. And that's the important bit, managed consequence. So for us, that's PNG. This, we have a special relationship with them, which is why we use them for, for this type of stuff. These guys are experts at managing consequence. They lose power once a day. They lose internet to the whole country a couple of times a day. They lose water. They have uh, civil unrest. They have earthquakes. These guys are used to systems breaking. And so we, use them. So we have an agreement with them where we push them, we, well, they get every update first. And they run it for a week, because they will break it. Our first release, I think it was like, we'd been, they'd been live for about two months and we switched on the AVL pipeline. Uh, yeah, Papua New Guinea doesn't have street numbers. If you, want to see a, if you want to see a geolocation API break really quick, then try not feeding them a street number, or in probably like 40% of cases, they don't have street names. 
That's a great way to test, and, I, and we'd never have found that. You'd never find that in Australia or New Zealand or any other places that we're deployed. They will test systems unlike you can. Okay, we're there. Boring is beautiful. Know your code. Love your exceptions. Sunshine is the best disinfectant. Train like you fight, and the best friends are critical. Hubris will get you every time. And when it does, people could get hurt. It's okay to fail, fail safe, respond appropriately. This was a presentation about approach and about attitude. It wasn't technical, if you want to talk technical, hit me up, I can talk technical all day. But it's the tip of the iceberg. Sitting behind all of this, there's analysis, there's systems designs, there's processes, procedures, checklists, redundancy plans, failover plans, failback plans, the whole thing. But this is a blueprint. It's allowed us to build something we think is awesome and I hope that in any small way, it can also help you. Thank you very much. Well done. <laughs> Quick. Yes, yeah, I'm getting water, go, hit me. Quick question. If we write more code in-house, instead of using as many packages, are we now reinventing the wheel? Don't reinvent the wheel. So the quote was for critical systems. So we use, like, we love first party packages, mm -hmm. so all of them, however, there's some packages, packages that we found that were overly complex and didn't, you know, were overly complex for what, what we needed. So it's easier for us to take inspiration from that package and write a subset that we kept in the house. So those really critical things mm -hmm. that we knew were gonna bite us in the butt when they go off. Yeah. Yeah. How, how are you handling exceptions from systems that you don't control? There's very few systems we don't control in our pipelines uh, because, uh, you know, in the concept, in the, in, in, in the context of PNG, we lose connectivity to them every day. So they have to run as an island. So we put everything in on prem. Yeah. Um, so, but for redundancy. So if an API fails and you get a weird error message, have a second option. Have something you can fail over to, and try doing the same thing a different way. Amazing. No worries. Thank you very much. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks, Ryan.